بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين Good evening everyone and thank you for joining KFAS Business Talk I am Firas Al-Uda and I will help you navigate this discussion the changing investment uh, landscape But first, I would like to invite the Director General of KFAS Dr. Adnan Ahmed Shahabuddin for his opening remark Dr. Adnan شكرا سيد فراس العودة وتحية طيبة لجميع المشاركين ورحب بكم جميعا باسم مؤسسة الكويت التقدم العلمي مشاركتنا هذه الليلة وهذا المساء لواحدة من ندوات الافتراضية التي تنظمها المؤسسة لتطرق إلى أحد من القضايا الهامة التي جاءت كان عكاس لجائحة كورونا في جميع القطاعات وعنوان الندوة الافتراضية كما تعلمون هو investment وتأثير الجائحة على المؤسسات الاستثمارية طبعا عالميا وطبعا محليا سأتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية في كلمة الترحيبية قد يكون معنا من المشاركين من لا يتحدثون باللغة العربية. Good evening everybody. We know that COVID has impacted everything. And once it's over, we know also that things will go back not to normal, but to a new normal. And we don't know fully yet what that new normal is going to be, but we are beginning to understand what that new normal to be. Each area, each sector, each individual, each country is planning for the new normal. It's important that we understand what happened, what have been the impact on various sectors in order to try to extrapolate or anticipate what the new normal should be and how we be prepared for it. We know that in Kuwait, the government has taken several important measures to support all efforts to combat the impact of COVID and its repercussions on various sectors, including the private sector, and especially the private sector, because in Vision 2035, the role of the private sector is crucial. And we are just beginning to see steps taken, policies and enacted to support the expansion of the contribution of the private sector to uh, Kuwait economy leading to realization of Vision 2035. We know that the economic activities in Kuwait, just like the rest of the world, has slowed down. For a few months, it slowed down to a trickle. But we also know that governments, including the government of Kuwait, have taken and are taking aggressive measures to, on the one hand, spread and contain and mitigate the COVID, but at the same time, doing things to mitigate its impact in various sectors and including the investment sector in Kuwait, which is really one of the most important private sector sectors, private sector uh, businesses. Uh, fiscal and money response of the government helped to mitigate or contain the impact so far. But much more is need to be done because there are challenges and these are indeed challenging times perhaps once in a century once in a lifetime but challenging times can be a catalyst to change that is long anticipated you can take advantage of the challenges for example we know that telegovernment or uh, intelligent government uh, electronic government has been discussed in kuwait for a long time but covid really kind of pushed us to take advantage. We were almost like ready. We were not taking the decision, but we took the plunge. And now we see many aspects of our government interaction with the citizen, with business is being conducted electronically. So we can take advantage of the opportunities to address the challenges. As part of KFAS effort to disseminate knowledge to help the private sector navigate during the difficult times such as these, we recognize that virtual events like tonight's seminar will facilitate peer learning, learning from those who 
have adapted, those who are expert and have done something that is valuable. They have a, a not only a vision, but they have experience in addressing it. So peer learning is very important to us, and we act as a catalyst by bringing peers to speak to their peers about their experience and how they can actually uh, benefit from such experience. So we are delighted tonight that we have invited the CEOs of two leading investment and management companies in Kuwait to discuss the changing investment landscape and what are the lessons learned from managing investment under COVID and what this would mean going forward in terms of the opportunities created and how we take advantage of them to move forward. We have tonight with us that will be introduced by my colleague, Mr. Firas, uh, two leading CEOs of investment. And uh, all what I can tell you about them that I know both of them very well. And uh, I don't really need to introduce them other than to say their first name tells all about them. They are Faisal Sarkhul and Faisal al -Hamid. They are Faisalain fi mawdu al investment. With that concluding remark, I wish to extend my greetings to you and hope that you will find this seminar very productive and very useful. For us, the floor is yours, or maybe I should say the screen is yours. Uh, I had a couple of points uh, of introductory I was planning to say, but mashallah, you covered a lot of ground, so I will not uh, take uh, any time further. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, and everybody is aware, uh, the year 2020 uh, proven to be quite challenging. Uh, that's to, to, to say the least uh, when it comes to, to challenges. Uh, continued uncertainty, the geopolitical uh, risk surrounding the area and globally, uh, and not to forget, of course, the, the pandemic and what this, this happened uh, because of, uh, of that situation. Uh, that created many unknowns. Uh, and uh, not only uh, to explain uh, this, we, we had to find also further gaps in terms of knowledge in order for us to try to fix uh, and find solutions going forward. Uh, this has created uh, what we can call uh, a void uh, of, of factors uh, that will help us uh, or made us you know, uh, try to find other ways to solve solutions, you know, rather than the typical uh, structured decision uh, process. Uh, with that uh, being said, uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming our uh, speakers today, uh, who uh, lead two of the major uh, investment companies' uh, houses in, in Kuwait, and uh, major players uh, in the region, uh, Mr. Faisal Sarkho, the CEO of Kanko Invest, and uh, Mr. Faisal al Hamad, the CEO of MBK uh, Capital. Gentlemen, if you join us, please. I would say join us on the stage, but I mean, it is a virtual uh, stage uh, in that matter. So while uh, we welcome uh, our guest, uh, let me just go through a couple of admin points. Uh, first, uh, when you want to ask questions, uh, please do that uh, in the uh, sort of, you know the related panel, not in the chat section. There is a Q&A section. Please uh, post your questions there, so I can manage to direct them to the speakers. The second item uh, we have a polling, uh, and we would love to hear your you know opinion on these poll. For that, I would want to start with the first poll. There is you know a question talking about what is your view and uh, expectation of the market, uh, two sections. One is the local market, talking about Kuwait Stock Exchange, and the US market, uh, and we chose the US as a major uh, economy, uh, as an indicator of the global uh, markets. Uh, I will turn first to uh, Mr. Sarkho. Uh, now, as we talked about the, the changing uh, dynamics in the market, how do you see it from your end? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for hosting me and uh, my colleague uh, Faisal Hamad to this uh, 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 virtual uh, uh, event and uh, appreciate the kind words of yourself and uh, those of Dr. Shahab. 
I think uh, KFAS has a, has a major contribution to us as uh, private sector players and the investment sector in particular. And we've, we've uh, really been thankful for all the different kinds of support and ideas and the events that have been taking place with, uh, with the sponsorship support of KFAS. So I wanted really to start with that before uh, addressing the question. Now, your question uh, revolves about evaluating market dynamics. And uh, I think uh, in, in, in when, you, when you look at the dynamics uh, that we have, uh, that we're facing today, you see, uh, you see a number of key factors that are impacting the market. So, and when you, when you look at that, you, you really have to look with the lens of both a, a global and the regional and at times a local context. It's very important to look at that. If you look at, uh, for example, comparing um, the, 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 the equity markets uh, uh, regionally and internationally, you see that uh, in 2019, all the markets performed extremely well, uh, double digit in, in, in most cases. Uh, and this this has been uh, an effect of growth and, uh, and development in, in, in the equity market so in that year. In 2020, of course, uh, a mul multiple factors have impacted uh, the situation, have uh, caused a lot of uh, volatility, a lot of uh, uncertainty, and uh, uncertainty and volatility uh, change the, the risk return uh, profile change. The, the, the way people look at things. If you, if you simply look at uh, equity markets, for example, a year to date, uh, the, 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 the overall picture is pretty, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at the world, it's a it's, it's single, very low digit uh, in terms of growth. Uh, the only positive factors and, uh, and they, they have impacted the, that overall growth is, is Asia and the US. These are the only two uh, uh, positive uh, uh, in, in terms of equity in the world. The rest have all been negative. Uh, emerging markets have been flattish. However, Europe has been severely hit. Uh, and uh, the emerging market, of course, is also a mix of, of, of different countries. In it. The, the, the issue that, that we face, uh, you have uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, Two, two stories. So you have the story, of course, the impact of the of the COVID, the impact of the oil sector and what's been going there, and you have on the other side as well uh, the the impact of um, lower interest rates and a lot of liquidity in the market. And if you see that, for example, the U.S. has been growing, growing from strength to strength. And it's interesting that you've started with the, with a question about uh, how do you expect the U.S. markets to perform by year end. Of course, the U.S. has major events uh, this year coming up, uh, the election of uh, uh, the existing or a new president, and uh, local, local markets are still dealing with the situation. Uh, the, the, the thing I'd like to add before, you know, I don't want to take too long. I think we can, of course, discuss this in different ways. The, the, the markets, the asset classes have all been impacted in different ways. And uh, we as investment professionals are wary. Uh, I don't know if Faisal would agree with me on this, but uh, you, you, there's a lot of uncertainty and you have to really, uh, you know, be very cautious in what you're doing, maintain liquidity, be opportunistic and also uh, adapt to this new world. I mean, we've had a lot of adapting to do, working from home, uh, doing events like this virtually, meetings virtually, different tools uh, being introduced to do this, making sure that your teams are, are there. And at least uh, I can say from our side, uh, as, as Camco, we've, we've operated as, as much as possible as we can uh, and uh, adapted uh, as much as we can. Uh, and really, it's, it's, uh, it is a tough time. But I think the new norms are, are, are still being uh, written and uh, still being shaped as we as, as we deal with this COVID situation uh, moving forward. Uh, Anna, I think it's Muhammad. The voice, you can. 
let me jump in على ما ابو محمد maybe gets his technical uh, issues sorted uh, just following up على uh, what uh, Faisal talked about in terms of the market um, I think uh, you know at the start of this year everyone came into this year expecting some sort of correction uh, for what was uh, in the US at least one of the longest and most hated bull markets um, COVID hit us We saw a significant correction, uh, but we also saw a very quick recovery from the lows that we had due to COVID and due to the market being overvalued. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think the key trends we need to look at are flows. Uh, and when I say flows, flows are a function of the interest rate environment that we're facing globally. We have a tsunami of cheap liquidity Uh, and cheap funding, which is inflating asset classes across the board. Um, and what's happened post-COVID is uh, correlations that Faisal, myself, and many others in the market used to bank on have become completely out of whack. So where we used to advise people to have a balanced portfolio, uh, when the COVID correction took place, fixed income and equities took a dip at the same time, which isn't something that is normal. Mm. I think all of us are trying to understand what's coming in the next three to six months. What I can guarantee is, is volatility uh, and some pain uh, and some gain. Um, I think we, we can uh, discuss how to position oneself for these developments moving forward. Because I think volatility is here to stay, at least in the short to medium term. I believe liquidity and cheap funding is here to stay short, medium term, globally. Uh, I think asset classes will act strange compared to what they've done historically. And from a more local perspective, I think given the MSCI upgrade coming up in November, um, I think we will have also significant volatility in the local market uh, when you dovetail that with, frankly, the results coming out of the key uh, earnings generators in the premier market in Kuwait being challenged. So uh, to follow up on this, so even though that most people believe that the market is overvalued, uh, they don't think the market is going anywhere and most probably will go down, they continue to buy the markets. So is it more about, you know, not left behind? If I may, uh, Mohammed, uh, I think KFAS is a very good example. You have a strategic asset allocation uh, plan as do many other pension plans and sovereign wealth funds across the world. No. People have to stay invested. Um, no one is going to take the career risk to go out and cash institution fully and miss a rally, which frankly we've seen in the last two or three months. So I think fundamentally, although again, from a fundamental standpoint, we all look at valuation and multiples and, and, and cash flows, I think in this environment, we have to be very aware of flows. And when I say flows, I mean the flow of money. Mm. Um, we will continue to have pension plans that have liabilities that they need to fund, and they will continue to push money into the system, whether in private equity, real estate, or public markets. That's a discussion we can have. But people will not go out of the market into cash because cash, if you're in euro today, is generating negative yields. You're actually paying. Mm. Bank to keep your money in the bank. And if you're in dollars, which is the predominant currency of our investors, you're generating 10, 15 basis points at best. So, uh, Mr. Sarko, as a last uh, comment on this question, uh, do you uh, buy into the, uh, the speculation, uh, trying to uh, bas basically go with the flow? Uh, trade the market, uh, maybe have some long-term strategic positions, as uh, Russell mentioned. However, you continue uh, to weather the storm. You don't want to uh, have some money sitting aside uh, for now. So you are more of an active uh, trader these days versus a longer term, or how do you see yourself at this time? I, I think, uh, and I agree with Faisal, the issue is, Uh, about the recoverability, the recoverability and the sustainability of that recovery. So we are seeing many recoveries. If you, if you look at the U.S. market, for example, you might have 
you know, uh, some negative uh, uh, information r relating to to uh, to you know COVID or relating to uh, certain aspects uh, in the economy or certain aspects uh, in, in the healthcare uh, fight against this COVID, and and you, you'd see the markets reacting. So that uh, volatility is 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 there to reflect the fact that uh, the sustainability of recovery is not there. So we are having many recoveries as we move along. And in that situation, uh, active managers uh, move as much as they can to, to opportunistic uh, side of the business and to keeping uh, healthy levels of cash and uh, trying to, to, to recover some of the losses uh, in certain parts, depending on where their asset allocation is. As Faisal mentioned uh, as well, that the impact, uh, the, the breakdown of the correlations is, uh, is, is, is heightened during this crisis. And uh, I think uh, as asset managers, in certain situations, certain instruments you have, certain funds, for example, you cannot be uh, all, all cash or all liquid or have heavy liquidity levels and have to be a participant in the market. Uh, I think another dynamic that uh, impacts us in Kuwait, at least, is, is the MSCI inclusion, which was delayed from pre-summer to fourth quarter. That uh, that uh, may, is a major major event for uh, passive investors and uh, later on active investors to to, to take on positions and uh, uh, put in put in their options. And and what we saw in in, in March when we had the, the biggest impact uh, in Kuwait and the region, we saw the markets. Uh, React and you saw flows, as Faisal also mentioned, uh, international flows and uh, local flows, maybe moving at times in different directions. Right. Uh, so that takes us nicely to our next uh, question, following question. If we have the next question up, please. Uh, and that's for uh, Mr. Hamid. Uh, so, do you see from your your clients' portfolio? Uh, any changes in terms of sentiments, uh, behavior? Do they get more impacted uh, by news, social media, uh, perceptions than, than before? You know, how, how is their mood these days? Oh, can I hear you? Yes, yeah. Uh, look, I, I think the mood was cautious. Uh, Mohammed, I mean, uh, we've gone through a lot this year. We, we really have, and I think we all need to take a step back and, and, and recognize it. And, and I think initially people were very uh, focused on their, on their health, on, on, their, on their families. As a second stage, people started focusing on their wealth. Uh, we have had a lot of conversations with our clients about uh, the period during the curfew. And frankly, we advise our clients to do the same today as we did a year ago and 10 years ago, which is assess what your time horizon is for investment. We are not traders, we are investors. If you want to trade the market, open a brokerage account, hopefully with MBK Capital, but with, 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 with Ula is also good. Um, yeah. If you want to actually invest your money in, 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 in a medium to long-term horizon, you need to understand that you have to be diversified across regions and across asset classes. The clients that we have advised in the past to diversify across regions and asset classes were not panicked during this drawdown because they saw all the correlations were, were out of whack. Generally speaking, the drawdowns were less than had they been in one stock in Kuwait or one stock in the US. So diversify across regions, across asset classes, make sure that fits in with your time horizon. And if you are looking to enter the market, enter the market using dollar cost averaging so that you don't choose one point in time that might either be good or bad. You average out over a certain period of time so you actually have an average cost that makes sense. Um, uh, all, please uh, just explain the, the last point just to, you know, just in case we have a general audience. Sure. So, so when I say dollar cost averaging, it's, it's a very fancy, word, fancy way of saying don't invest all your money like God, in, one, in one go. Yeah. What you need to do is you need to, depending on the amount, what you should be doing is you should be doing it over three months, over a month, over a year, and you come in systematically. So you remove all emotion and all timing 
from when you enter the market. Uh, that allows you to average your entry point in the market. So if the market is going down, you're averaging down. If it's going up, you're averaging up to a certain degree. A last point before I hand over is we always advise our clients not to liquidate when markets are falling because that's usually an emotional decision mm. and really it's the worst time to do it. And we have been proven right yet again this time because the markets came down aggressively, but they've rebounded aggressively. Our clients have not lost money as of today. MSCI World is up 4%, S&P is up 8%. NASDAQ, which we don't focus on solely, is up 30%. Yeah. Phenomenal. Here to date. So th those, are, those are the discussions we have with our clients. So, um, Mr. Stafo, are we uh, seeing clients still asking uh, questions about the fundamentals of companies, their, their uh, financials, their uh, strings of balance sheets? Is this still a question, fundamentals versus momentum trading, is still a valid strategy these days? I think uh, at the end of the day, as, uh, as professional investment houses, uh, the approach of asset allocation is key and, and, and the asset allocation changes with the time. So adapting to changes of uh, investor sentiment and their behavior means understanding your clients. So if you look at the, the COVID period and the work from home period, what's happened is that the access to clients became more virtual, more on telephones. Uh, and, and when I speak with, with our client facing teams, uh, I feel that they are, they don't have, uh, uh, you know, a weekend set or a time frame set. So they're working in the evenings during the day. Yeah, as you're aware, as, as clients and as professionals, we're all uh, based somewhere right now. We're not traveling, uh, very limited travel. Uh, more time on our hand, uh, people are reviewing their portfolios, reading more. I think from that perspective, I think uh, clients are are, are, are are looking, just like they do in their own homes, are also looking at their portfolios, looking what they can do in their own businesses. Uh, we've seen a lot of clients on the investment banking looking at how they can uh, fine tune their business model for the new norm. So uh, from a perspective of investing, I think uh, it is it is uh, key that uh, investment houses have that proper line of communication and service orientation and support level uh, consideration of what kind of products that are suit suitable for the time. And I think here, when you have uh, a multitude of uh, products, helps uh, in, in terms of the ability to navigate and asset allocating with your own products, with third-party products or third-party services. And products, uh, it's it's uh, we we personally have seen for uh, in the past few months, for example, uh, we've been able to raise around two hundred fifty million dollars for uh, new products during the COVID period. So uh, investors are there, uh, liquidity is there, the right type of product uh, attracts their attention, and, uh, and and we we see we see that. Uh, Yes, you rebalance, you might come and say that, look, uh, locally, regionally, I'll reduce my exposure, I'll increase it internationally, uh, benefiting from, from the, the gains. Um, I think uh, investors in general are savvy and liquidity is there. So opportunistic uh, alignment on the, on the risk return uh, profile is happening all the time. Uh, so our job is to reiterate and identify and guide and advise based on, on short-term, medium-term, long-term uh, objectives of those investors and clients. Um, I have a question uh, I want to direct to Mr. Alhamed, uh, maybe to answer live. Uh, in terms of a, you know, a possibility of a second wave, um, what could be a contingency plan uh, as asked by uh, Isam? Um, you know, is there certain measures needs to be put in place? I lost your voice. Are you trying it? Or just generally? No, in terms of you know, you know, in planning the market with the expectation of a possibility of a second wave of COVID, is there any uh, plans uh, to mitigate or you know, as, as a contingency uh, plan? 
Look, again, I come back to I come back to how you view the market. If you are okay, so what I would suggest for people who have these thought processes uh, is put aside a certain amount of cash that you want to keep for opportunistic purposes, right? And I think there you can play certain themes uh, in the market based on your on where things are going with COVID, for instance, yeah. or with U.S. elections. Okay, yeah. but I think fundamentally, I come back to what I said earlier on. You need to have a medium to long term, unless unless you're hitting retirement in, in the next five years, oh. you should have a medium to long term view on your investment guidelines. You should remain fully invested, as Faisal was saying. You should rebalance, and the asset allocation looks can shift based on uh, the reality on the ground. Uh, and I think you just need to stick to that strategy. You can't time. COVID. Uh, I mean, if I knew what to do before the second, second, uh, you know, if there was a second wave, number one, and what to do, frankly, I think I would be on a yacht somewhere in San Tropez. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, respect and, 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 you know, and on vacation. But I think fundamentally, yeah. if I were to look at moving forward, what's going to happen? I think if we do hit the second wave, my personal opinion is we will not see the economic shutdowns that we saw in the first wave. I think there is too much political anger and momentum against shutting down economies the way we saw them in Q1 and Q2. What you will see is selective shutdowns, and what you will see is certain industries take a bigger hit, maybe hospitality or travel, and other industries sort of come back uh, uh, and, and make more money on the back of it, maybe you know, things like digital retailing like Amazon or, or Apple or, or the likes of the, yeah. uh, the fans. So uh, let, let me take uh, the second question to Mr. Sarkhoud. talks about the uh, Kuwait uh, local markets and uh, the recent uh, correction in the markets. Um, how do you see the possibility of correction there? I think uh, uh, if, I, if I was to look at uh, Kuwait uh, in particular, if you look at the earnings reports, now we're, we've just about finished the earnings season and the GCC in general, the, the, the fall and uh, in, in overall revenue is around 46 to 47 percent uh, in earnings. Now, the impact of that, uh, it's, of course, it's, it's been addressed in the local market and the regional markets has all the markets have have have, have fallen in valuations to a certain level, but some may say that these valuations are still high, taking into consideration how the, the, the fall in the earnings will, if there's a recovery, what kind of recovery, how will companies cope with recovering uh, lost earnings uh, from their side. So have we seen the full impact of, of this to our market? I, I don't believe so. I think uh, as, uh, as, as we get into the end of quarter three and the year end, you will see a lot of uh, companies that are uh, have ample liquidity or the ability to borrow and are struggling not with that side of, of the business or not with the with the side not with the side of their balance sheet, but with the side of their profitability and earnings and uh, mm -hmm. revenue side. So I, I think the Kuwait the Kuwaiti market was one of the most uh, severely hit, uh, and uh, I think the the, the plans and uh, things that have been set. Uh, to support the private sector could have been better. Excellent. So um, I'll take it further in terms of the, our discussion, uh, and maybe we'll come back to some of the questions uh, later on. I see some people are interested in gold, so I'll leave this for maybe the, the end of the discussion. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the regulation, and this is more uh, specific uh, to the local uh, market, uh, how do you sense the, the current uh, requirements, the compliance uh, required from either the CMA, the uh, central bank, depends on the banks and so forth? How do you, how do you find it in terms of, uh, is it uh, something that you feel is helping uh, the investment uh, prospects uh, or it could be a drag at some point, just of, uh, takes a longer time to comply in certain areas? Uh, Mr. Sarko? Um, I've, uh, we've, uh, as you're aware, you know we've been uh, very close with the CMA and 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 the and the, and the privatization of uh, Borsa Kuwait, 
And uh, in that effort, uh, we've seen from them a serious intent onto the, the moving Kuwait, you know, from the front frontier to the emerging market, which is a huge success. Uh, along this journey, of course, there's been a lot of uh, uh, important and milestone uh, decisions that have uh, come out to help uh, make the market uh, have better governance, more transparency, uh, support uh, new instruments to come out. We still are, you know, getting you know more traction onto these new instruments coming out to the market. So the regulator in, in our side uh, or the Capital Markets Authority has been very helpful with the sector to 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 try to enhance the level of professionalism, uh, speed the, the 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 approach. Of course. Uh, every time something new is introduced, it takes time for it to be adapted by both uh, market participants and the regulator. Uh, one of the good things that they've been doing is, is issuing white papers to get feedback, mm -hmm. uh, meetings uh, to, to, to further understand uh, what needs to be done. And I think their, their role is uh, pivotal in, in what, what needs to be done. There are certain things, of course, that have to be looked at. Uh, for example, the, there was a directive issued for uh, doing capital adequacy until the year end uh, in a testing form for it to be formulated officially from next year. That's uh, something that uh, they would have to look at for, for businesses. They've pushed the digitization on their front, and I think this is where the creativity can come in to uh, digitize more processes and, and reporting. Uh, as both companies and, and the regulator do that. So I think the, the drive to continue developing transparency governance, uh, uh, helping uh, the fledgling debt markets, uh, uh, the use of data and information. Uh, I, I think the, the, there's a multitude of, of uh, good actions that, that have been taken and are being taken. So, uh, Mr. Hamad, you can see the, the answers to the questions. Uh, it's quite, uh, uh, you know, mixed, I would say. Uh, but I can see there is about 40% asking for more flexibility. Um, is this could be driven by the fact that the government controls most of the businesses? You know, 90% of the, the employees are, you know, by the government. Uh, the budget uh, rate is about 60% of it goes to paying salaries. How do you see this? Um, well, Mohammed, I, I think I'm going to limit, I, I think, listen, I, I think I'm going to limit my conversation right now to uh, the regulator that we deal with specifically, just to place on mention, and then we can, if you want, we can, we can address other issues. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I agree with what Faisal is saying. I think there are three elements here in terms of compliance, specifically relating to financial markets. I think number one, the CMA has done a phenomenal job of cleaning up, frankly, what was a very wild, wild west market, uh, Kuwait. And I think the results yeah. have been phenomenal. And as Faisal said, it's not easy for us to become an emerging market. For us to become an emerging market, a lot of work and a lot of regulation. So for me, regulation is good uh, because I think it protects the investors and it makes our market look like a world-class market, number one. Number two, regulation always increases cost. I think you will find people that struggle with that element. And I think you will find that some firms will shut down or will delist or will have a combination of both because they realize that they can't, they're, they're subscale. They're not big enough to be able to deal with the regulatory cost that is across the world increasing on a daily basis. So I think you'll see some consolidation, some issues around that, and I understand why people might be a bit annoyed by the uh, the regulatory sort of uh, uh, requirements and how that affects their business. But I think overall it's a good thing. Number three, what I used to wish for, and I continue to wish for, is more rapid adoption of digital um, uh, regulation for financial markets. COVID, uh, COVID actually helped a little bit. Frankly, I think the CMA has now pushed ahead with some of their initiatives. And I look forward to the CMA and others in the market to really push ahead with fintech type regulations because that's the future. And if we don't do it here, 
the barriers are so low that people will come from outside of Kuwait and will eat our lunch, which is unacceptable. For us. Um, Mr. Sarkho, in terms of our competitiveness uh, versus the region, so I, I'm not going to name names, but in the GCC, uh, is there a, a, a space for regulators to allow uh, investment companies to offer more products in order to attract more investment? Uh, of course, uh, I, I truly believe that the asset management space in general is uh, uh, quite a, uh, a nascent uh, market. Uh, international markets, if you look at uh, you know Europe and the US and Asia and in the developed uh, part of the world, you'll see that there are so many uh, uh, pension funds, you ha you'll have so many institutional uh, players. We're still growing our institutional part uh, in, in, in our region. And uh, I think this is an area of growth. Uh, other initiatives will come in, in, in time. I mean, the, the DIFC, for example, is starting initiatives on, on funding indemnities and uh, having those uh, done, done in a different way. You have uh, taxation has been introduced in parts of the GCC and might, might expand in other parts. So uh, complexity is increasing. So the role of the regulator and uh, how they uh, help the, the, the investment uh, sector grow is very important. Uh, give, you, give you one example, the debt capital markets. Our debt capital markets mm -hmm. have to evolve more. Uh, and it's, it's an area of growth that, that we expect and uh, uh, anticipate that it has to continue to grow uh, in, in terms of the debt instruments, not in terms of... Uh, you know, the bonds, cook, uh, uh, structured uh, instruments that have to come. So there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of growth prospects in the region that, that, we, the, that we hope to see. Excellent. Uh, so, um, Mr. Hamid, if we move to the next uh, question, uh, talking about foreign investment. And we have a question, uh, if you can put the question up. Uh, how do you find uh, the current level of investment uh, in, in Kuwait? Uh, and, and probably the most important part, uh, is there something we can do to attract more investment, for investment? I think um, our suboptimal in Kuwait, to be very honest. Mm. We had good flows uh, in, in, in 2019. We had approximately $2 billion of flows into the market. Um, obviously, now with COVID, uh, things have taken a bit of a step back, but we're still about 1.4 billion. And this is off the back of what we were talking about earlier, which is the inclusion. Now, mm. I get this question a lot, and I think fundamentally we need to take a step back again. A market is only as attractive as its economy. Sorry. A market is not attractive in and of itself. We cannot complain about the market and attracting uh, investments into the market unless the economy is attractive. Unfortunately, our economy today is not very diversified. COVID is less of an issue for me today than oil. We will get past COVID. I am confident, inshallah, we will get past COVID, whether it's a year, 18 months, we will be past it. But we will not get past oil being, frankly, a commodity that is on the most likely downtrend. So unless we <laughs> like, <laughs> I will leave it to you at KFAS as well to find ways for us to diversify. I won't, I won't jump too deep on this topic, but the point I'm making is the macro has to make sense for the micro to make sense. Today, the macro doesn't make sense, frankly, uh, given the, the, the world uh, uh, sort of environment around uh, demand for oil. And I think we will struggle post-inclusion to continue to attract flows on the merits of the economy alone. I think we will have a struggle. We need to address that. Excellent. So, uh, so Mr. Sarkhoi, I mean, this is the highest uh, percentage in terms of the poll. Everybody, with no exception, maybe two people only from the participants who thinks we should get uh, more foreign uh, investment into the economy. Um, is there, you know, easy uh, steps that we can take? Uh, you, you know, Mr. Faisal Hamid talked about uh, uh, restructure, uh, more deeper uh, fixes. Is there something, you know, we could work on in the next couple of years 
to get this number higher? I think uh, it's important to, to look at our ecosystem. And the ecosystem uh, basically includes different elements, from the airport to the hospitality side, to the to the law side, to the to the you know the the, the regulatory side, to the eco economic growth prospect side. If you if you look at uh, Kuwait, uh, you know diversification is needed. So if you're driving for that diversification and wanting to have more flows coming in then you have to have that in a sustainable way that show that allows for investors because if they're coming into the market be it passive or be it active uh, and and pulling out as active players or passive players they, they the, the, those flows are uh, up to a certain level they're sizable they're, it's a great achievement but then the prospects uh, you you have to look back at kuwait for example in the early um, you know 2000 to 2003 uh, at that time, uh, and I recall uh, what was one of the biggest drivers for the economy and, and uh, the growth was, was that the fact that uh, there was a lot of activity happening, expectations were put on uh, development of uh, Iraq, uh, post-liberation, and that uh, a lot of businesses can uh, you know, grow their businesses there and uh, regionalization of operations was happening in the MENA region in particular, and that gave... Uh, gave a view for a, a good medium to long-term uh, growth in revenue. Uh, now, uh, it's important really for that ecosystem, you have to remember that we, uh, we in Kuwait are competing uh, with, with other uh, markets, be it regional or even international. So for, for, for international investors to be attracted, uh, you need to have uh, elements that attract them. And uh, one of the key elements is to have that ecosystem that whether it's you know if we talked about flexibility is, is very important flexibility in, in in how you do business flexibility in how you hire flex, different different elements are are there but the ecosystem needs to be worked on in my opinion and I think it's been worked on but in a slow uh, it should be faster than this that's uh, my view. So uh, uh, if Mohammed, I think just to add, I think you know, to, to answer also your question around what are the short term uh, things that could attract F you know, foreign direct investment or even portfolio flows, more importantly. I think you're talking to two people that, had, frankly, a, alhamdulillah, a successful tajriba uh, uh, in listing public companies. We talk about listing public companies all the time, all the time. And frankly, until Azur and Borsa, we haven't had a real public listing in a long time. And these two, inshallah, uh, with the Borsa coming to the market soon, these two examples are great examples of A, the amount of liquidity that exists in the market, both locally and internationally, for good opportunities. We can both try to bring as many family businesses to the public markets as possible, which is not an easy thing to do, but it won't move the needle as much as the government privatizing some of the key assets that they have that are actually good assets. And I think that's something the government can do in the next six to 18 months, increase the market cap of Kuwait and increase the foreign investments into Kuwait. Hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll push you further on this one, uh, Vessel. Uh, how is this gonna impact the, the, the KD? Uh, is it, are we going to see the value of KD because of that to attract more or has nothing to do with it? Which phase are you talking about? Uh, whether you are politically sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> I will record you now. Uh, look, I, I think the KD, no. I, I have no worries that the KD will be... Uh, 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 devalued, by the way, the KD is, is, is pegged to a basket of currencies, right? So the KD moves. It's not a fixed rate like Saudi or El Emirat. Or, you know, uh, so, yeah, the market, the, the KD has moved over the last 18 months, two years, uh, in terms of, uh, depending on which currency you're looking at. Huh? It's appreciated against some, it's depreciated against others. Today, I think Liquid is the best suited and the best placed not to have pressure on the currency in the GCC, okay? And I don't think 
devaluing or you know aggressively depegging or you know taking the basket out free floating the currency is going to happen anytime in the medium term so i'm not i'm not concerned about that in the in the short to medium term um so, so on the same question uh well i think uh, this is a, i would call it a, a tool of last resort mm. it is a, a very uh, devaluing of the kd is is uh, something that uh, uh, should not be considered when we have a lot of uh, efforts that have to be exerted on stopping wastage on uh, growing uh, you know cutting uh, cutting unnecessary expenses uh, looking at uh, things that need to be sorted out in our in our economy the privatization the drive towards efficiency uh, the 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 new economy and you know i saw one of the questions talking about new businesses that uh, that they can invest in in, the, in, in in kuwait i think we should consider the covid period uh, and what we're going through as a period of relooking at the business model and focusing on on the long term plan of uh, having a stronger private sector uh, the the challenge sometimes we face is that the private sector is not looked at uh, as as meaningful it's just 5% of the economy if not less and mm -hmm. i think uh, we have to consider that the going back to the question is that the uh, instruments such as tackling the kd should not uh, should not be looked at right now there is no need for it in, uh, in the in at least the medium term uh, and i i expect uh, that that there are a lot of other tools and efforts that have to be taken first so uh, a question for for both uh, uh, you know either one can take it on uh, now there is the discussion of the public debt and the need for public debt and uh, you know of course we're going to go to the foreign market to you know uh, attract uh, companies and institutions to buy uh, kuwait issued uh, fixed income bonds uh, how do you see the position of kuwait is it going to have a good valuation uh, compared to what was issued recently in Saudi and UAE? Uh, if I may, uh, whether uh, I think I think uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, um, it's a no-brainer. You know, if we want to tie in some of the things we talked about today, uh, there are there aren't that many good investment opportunities nor yielding investment opportunities in the international markets today. Kuwait is an investment grade credit, La Tazal investment grade credit, with a good debt to GDP ratio, low by international standards. The first issuance was a complete success. The second issuance will be a complete success. Abu Dhabi issued 50 year paper last week, 50 year paper at a year below 3%. It is criminal of us not to tap the international markets at this time because we need to make sure that we are getting the lowest cost of funding for the country and we can. Now, with that being said, I understand people are worried about what are the uses of those uh, monies that come in and how do you ensure that it's used for the right purposes. That's a separate discussion that is linked. It is linked. Yeah. But today there is a phenomenal opportunity in the market to raise really cheap funding for the country. And we need to take advantage of that responsibly. I fully agree with Faisal on this. I think uh, the interest rate environment uh, is, is there uh, for uh, borrowing to be taken. Uh, and I think uh, long-term funding uh, options are there. Um, really, if, if, if I want to, I'd like to simplify it, really. If you have a plot of land and you're sitting there saying this is a valuable plot of land and you don't have the money to build on it and create revenue from it, then you sit on a plot of land and not, not move forward. But if you develop a property on it and, and, and generate revenue from it, then you are creating value. We have a problem uh, in, in that we need to consider that uh, if we are going to go to the international debt markets, we have to have a proper plan of deployment of where that will be deployed, what will that deployment generate. We know, we understand there are a lot of infrastructure projects that need to be taken and that are important for the future of the country. There's a few things that uh, that that uh, that are required for this. So 
at this stage of time to be uh, to be uh, not getting into the capital debt markets uh, is is really uh, a negative on the future of of, of uh, you know our, how our financial strength will be. So the longer we take to move, the the the, the more the expectations are for more negative uh, than positive future. Excellent. Uh, let me uh, move forward, uh, and our next uh, topic is more about uh, AI uh, and how does this uh, help the, the services and products of the sector. Uh, you know, we see more about the, the uh, robo advisors um, introduced, and I believe indicated introduced something. Some other companies uh, in Kuwait in the region introduced uh, part. Uh, how does it benefit? The, I would say, from, from the side of the provider, yourself, uh, and uh, to the uh, receiver when it comes to cost, speed, uh, access to products or, or opportunities that probably in, 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 in an absence of that, we will not be able, let's say, as an individual, for example, get into these funds or these opportunities. I'll start with uh, first uh, Mr. Sarho and then I'll go to Mr. Uh, I, I think... Uh... Uh, artificial intelligence and AI in general is becoming more and more important, and COVID has uh, uh, expedited the the, the 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 need for growing that in different uh, places. So, if you if you look at it, uh, you know the the if you if you look at uh, something that a lot of managers and leaders look for, uh, business intelligence tools, for example. If you are able to capture data, if you are able to assess what's going on as, as leaders, you are able to adapt quicker. And this is happening more and more as, as more companies are apply, applying uh, uh, intelligent approaches and artificial intelligence in their business. On the product side, of course, commoditization of products has resulted in uh, what, what, what is uh, what is being used with AI to, 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 to reach levels that uh, is almost exceeding uh, the, the active uh, markets. So, and if, if, I mean, I, looking at, at how companies are trying to generate alpha and competing on that while also creating, uh, creating products that clients want to, want to have that are more benchmark, uh, uh, benchmark based is, 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 uh, I mean, both bo both are important, but AI is having a significant impact, and we still haven't seen uh, the impact going more forward. Uh, there are things to to happen in enhancing operational efficiencies, uh, improvements on products and uh, content distribution, uh, management of risk with information uh, being more solid and uh, up to date. So AI will have a significant, is having a significant impact and will have a significant impact in the back office side of businesses, investment company businesses, and front office side. Uh, you know, I think Faisal covered uh, broadly uh, the, uh, the impact of AI. I'd like to just talk about our experience in uh, the robo-advisory space. We started something called Smart Wealth. And frankly, we're seeing an amazing um, tajawu. It took us a little bit of time to educate the market, but it is doing the following, Bo Mohammed, you mentioned it. It is allowing us to provide what we would provide our high net worth individuals. Uh, let's say 80% of what we can provide our high net worth individuals can be translated into a digital proposition to the retail investor or to the younger investor. What does that mean? That means that they are getting access to best-in-class products at smaller tickets, and they can build a savings plan for their children, for themselves, for a house, uh, for a variety of different requirements in life on a very systematic and low-ticket, low amount, yeah, dinar, uh, 100KD a month, is doable. This was not before we launched this robot advisory product because it required manual intervention, which means higher cost, which means higher ticket or higher amount from each investor. So we could not address them in the past. We are today addressing hundreds, if not thousands actually in, in, in the next six months of people coming on board 
testing it out in small amounts and then ramping it up. So I think technology is something we need to embrace. It will compete with our existing business models, but I think if done the right well, uh, if the, the right way, it will be complementary to growing assets under management. So do you see, uh, to follow up on this, uh, you know, clients a little bit hesitant to de deal with the computer in terms of, you know, knowing their interest and, and uh, demands interaction. Is that this kind of reservation? Yes, there is a reservation. And actually, when we studied the robo advisory landscape, you find that robo advisors that are a single brand, i.e. Ro robo advisor ABC, has a hard time getting the trust of the public in taking money from them. This is why I think we have a good value proposition where we are, because people know they're still investing in the NBK group universe through a digital channel. So that's number one. So we feel that given that they know us and we, you know, we, we know the clients, they feel more at ease giving money over an app uh, versus going and talking to someone in a branch or in the head office. That's number one. Uh, number two is we still feel and we still see clients, we, we were talking about it today, that will call us up and say, did the money arrive or not? Uh, right. What we're doing now is creating push notifications in the app so that the client knows that his money arrived and is in the process of getting invested. Because if they call us, and unless we have a bot or we have something automated, we're back to square one in terms of actually having a higher cost to service those clients, and it's unfeasible. So again, we're using technology to give people comfort by keeping them super aware of where they are in the process when they give us their money, because that's a, that's a very, very heavy trust uh, element of, of the business model. Uh, I want to conclude with this question for, with Mr. Sarko. Uh, is there a, a ground for more uh, efficiency using AI in terms of, uh, rather than the robo-advisory, just the other elements of the business when it comes to compliance, uh, middle office, and things like that? Have you seen a, any good uh, improvements or products out there to help the businesses? And of course, to make you more efficient uh, and cost uh, you know, relative to other competition in the market? For sure. I think uh, if you look at uh, AI, it's uh, a, a key component in, in, in the bigger road trip of digitization. And if you look at digitization in general, uh, AI will help uh, refine and improve efficiencies. We've seen that. Uh, I mean, we've, uh, we've uh, completed a merger uh, in December and that merger allowed us to look at our systems with a closer eye, look at comparisons, look at how we can revamp uh, what we what we need to do. And digitization was a, a big theme for us before COVID. Uh, once we were done with that uh, transaction, our focus as, as we speak is on digitization internally and externally. We've introduced uh, numerous tools that have made life uh, easier uh i i give you just one example and maybe if i don't know if, if uh, some of the listeners uh, are, are are using uh, docusign docusign has has helped uh, uh, cut the cycle of uh, you know uh, paper wastage time wastage uh, so a lot of initiatives that are coming in and where you can really store your your documents in a better way sign them off in a, in a secure way, uh, have them transact uh, across borders and uh, seeing acceptance uh, in, in many jurisdictions, in many places with regulators as well. Uh, with more technology, uh, the AI element will play a bigger role because once you are applying more technology, more digitization, what you're doing with AI, you're able to look at efficiency in a scientific way rather than in a general way. So if you are able to quantify where time is wasted, where things are happening uh, and, and, and need to happen faster or need to improve in a, in a, in a specific way, uh, AI will really significantly move the needle, in my opinion, uh, moving forward. Excellent. Uh, I want to bring back uh, the first question, first two questions about the, the US and the local markets back again. Uh, just to see if we changed any of the opinions of the audience, okay? Uh, if people are participating. 
Um, with that, uh, if I may uh, conclude in terms of a general comment, uh, of course, I mean, investors this year saw, uh, you know, bull markets that we haven't seen uh, in a long time. We keep breaking records uh, every couple of days. Uh, at the same time, uh, the debt level is at a, at a high. Um, you know, people are, you know, confused. They don't know what to do. Uh, of course, uh, each individual, whether it's a person uh, taking care of themselves, taking care of their family, uh, thinking about uh, a corporate side, whether it is shareholders, stakeholders, or they are an endowment, and so forth, or, or a government uh, sovereign uh, side also. Each one would have a different strategy they have, they have to think about. There's no one strategy that fits all. There is no one size that fits all when it comes to investment, and I believe my colleagues here uh, would, would agree uh, to that. So uh, what do we do? So, so we have to ensure that, you know, our protection in terms of our wealth. Uh, we have to put in uh, plans in terms of how to manage uh, our risk, uh, given where you are in terms of the spectrum uh, of an investor, uh, you know, a savvy investor, a mature investor, a beginner, and so forth. You, you know, you have to understand where you are and don't push yourself. You know, you don't have to understand everything when it comes to investment. I know, you know, here in Kuwait, we, we are experts in everything. But I mean, in this case, you will lose money. It's different than you just talk about something and nothing happens. Here, you're going to lose money uh, in that uh, case. Uh, diversification is key. Uh, we have to think about diversification uh, from the element of uh, you know, getting exposure to different markets. Uh, not only from the protection of the downside, also uh, to gain the opportunity. Uh, I think uh, liquidity proven to be key uh, in recent uh, recent times. This is something you know investors has to continue to to look at uh, and uh, keep close uh, eye on. Uh, and uh, the, the strategies are not set in stone; uh, they need to be reviewed on a regular basis. We have to reflect on them reflect on what is happening in the market, uh, what is the, the feedback we're receiving from others, and continuously uh, update your strategy uh, as you go on. Now, there is a longer term strategy and a short short term uh, or medium term strategy that needs to be affected. However, your strategy has to be always, I am investing way long term. I'm not gonna invest for a day or two or a month or two. I have to talk about years when it comes uh, to investment. Uh, with that, uh, I would wish to uh, thank our uh, speakers today uh, for their time. I know it's a quite uh, busy time for them. Uh, markets are doing better. Uh, hopefully, business is also doing uh, better in that sense. Uh, and uh, on behalf of everybody uh, today uh, in our attendees, uh, and I thank you uh, for participating. And of course, I thank uh, our participants. It was quite an interactive uh, session. And that's what our intention was. And we hope that we added value today. Uh, while we know today there is no lockdown, so I know we are holding you back. So I know everybody wants to go out, uh, but don't stay late. So uh, again, uh, let's just be careful uh, and avoid any further uh, issues when it comes to this pandemic. Uh, any uh, closing remarks from, uh, let's start with Mr. Sarkho and then let's start with Mr. Hamid. Uh, just, just like to say thank you for hosting us uh, for this event, and of course, uh, really wishing for uh, everybody to be safe and uh, uh, investment uh, inv investing uh, cautiously and carefully. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dave. Thank you, thank you for the uh, for the time from the audience. Thank you, Mohammed. Appreciate it. To uh, uh, I'm open uh, to have any questions. You know, feel free to contact me. Oh, things will get better, inshallah. Inshallah. So let's smile for the for the, for the picture, please. I said I saw one. I'm not sure. I'm gonna use the camera to show and share. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we'll see you around the uh, weather, Bagdadif, and thank you very much for taking the time. Our audience, thank you again. And hopefully to see you again uh, to, in a, another uh, business talk uh, from uh, KFAS. Take care and good night.